Okay, cool. So, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to Hack Night. For those of you that are new, we are. Um, this is the Osiris Labs uh, Hack Night. This is a weekly lecture we give at this time on Thursdays, 6:30 on Thursdays. Um, sort of what we try to do at Hack Night is uh, have a student-run lecture on some CTF topic, some cybersecurity topic. Uh, generally, that's going to be a little bit more interactive than tonight's going to be, but uh, this specific topic, getting started with assembly, is very difficult for a lot of new people. So we're going to try to take it slow tonight and uh, really build up from, from nothing, basically. So yeah, the name of the lecture is going to be Practical Assembly from the Ground Up. That's exactly what we're going to be doing tonight. We're going to be taking these concepts in assembly uh, from basically as much as I could dumb it down as possible and then build it up to what it actually looks like. Um, yeah, and by the way, my name is John Kniff. I'm the, uh, for, for those of you that are in Intro to OS, I'm the Infrastructure TA. Um, I don't do your grading, but I wrote the Anubis um, like auto testing system, uh, and I'm the Osiris Lab president. Uh, so yeah, I think we can go ahead and get started. So, so sort of what we're going to be doing today is we're st first going to start and talk about just, you know, what it, who is this lecture targeted for? Uh, you know why why should we even be doing this? And what mindset should we go into talking about this? From there, we're going to go into some basic assembly topics like memory registers and basic instructions. Um, that is going to be like very very dumbed down. Um, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to try to take those really dumbed down topics and move them to what they actually look like. And then the last thing that we're going to do is talk about tools. Um, tools are your best friend um, with this. And uh, for th those of you that are in OS, one unfortunate thing is that there's not enough time to really get into tools. Um, if you know how these tools work, it's it will help you a lot if you are ever doing anything with assembly. Um, yeah, cool. So. Who is this for? People new to assembly. Um, I specifically wrote this targeting people that are new to assembly in the intro to operating systems class or new people that are trying to learn how to, how to do this. Um, if you want to be a, a better programmer, assembly is a really great way to do this because understanding how this works is uh, greatly beneficial. This is the lowest levels of software. This is where software meets hardware, basically. Um, so yeah, uh, for those of you that are interested in cybersecurity, this is basically where you need to start to start playing reverse engineering or pwning challenges. That's where, you know, you're either figuring out, figuring out how something works or using, uh, your knowledge of assembly to exploit some kind of a vulnerability in a program. Um, yeah. So we're going to start with very abstract, uh, concepts, uh, for things, and then we're going to build that up to what it actually looks like. Um, so what is assembly? Let's talk about that. Uh, I guess the question that you should ask yourself is, have you ever wondered how a machine can run code? You know, um, The answer to that is a machine code or uh, bytecode. Uh, machine code is translated from assembly. So even though these things are sort of the same thing, they're, they're like the same thing, but in a different form. You can think about it as water can be a solid or it can be a liquid or, or a gas. Um, that's sort of how you can think about machine code and assembly. Assembly is when we're referring to assembly, we're talking about the human readable form. When we're talking about machine code, we're talking about the compiled form. Um, yeah. So the machine code is what your CPU is actually interpreting and running. Um, yeah, the, these instructions, these assembly instructions, let you modify your processor, they let you modify your memory, and they let you modify other physical devices directly. So why should we even care about any of this, right? Like, you know, it's so low level, we, we can be programmers and not know anything about assembly and be very successful, right? So why should we even care about this at all? Um, well, there are basically no rules at this level. Um, well, there are some, but for the most part, there's it's it's really a free for all in the way that the things work at this low level. Um, because of that, 
mistakes and bugs uh, at this level very often lead to vulnerabilities. And when vulnerabilities are exploited, that's you know obviously a bad thing. Um, yeah. And just generally to better understand how computers actually work, right? Um, everything has to be run, uh, that, that is run, has to be translated back to assembly into machine code. Um, there is no way of possibly avoiding that. Um, the computer that you're viewing this lecture from, the stream you're watching it on, the servers that are passing all that data through, it's all running on assembly. Um, so th this low level is completely unavoidable. Um, yeah. Another thing is that assembly can't lie. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, have you ever paid for a program and downloaded it to your phone or to your... Have you ever uh, paid for an application and um, downloaded it to your phone or your computer or whatever? If you really wanted to, you could take time to uh, use programs to read what the actual assembly is in that program and uh, potentially figure out what it's doing or how it's working. Um, yeah. Uh, we call this reverse engineering. It's a whole uh, field of cybersecurity, basically. You know, how can you produce something in code that is protected by uh, intellectual property, uh, put it out in the public, and have people not pull it apart and figure out how it works and steal it, right? That's like a whole, it's a whole thing. Um, yeah, so the required mindset going into this, the, the rest of this lecture. Uh, I'm going to ask you to do something pretty difficult. Uh, I'm going to ask you to set aside uh, whatever understanding you have of programs uh, of how programs work in whatever language you might be familiar with in Python, C++, Java, Go, whatever. Um, instead, I want you to try to conceptualize this as a full and totally new way of thinking. And from there, um, uh, yeah, don't connect it back to, uh, don't try to connect these things to your current understanding of how programs work uh, just yet. Uh, once we have these systems conceptualized and we really understand them, then I want you guys to try to connect this to your understanding of whatever languages you already know. Um, we're going to be dealing with C specifically because C has a very close to one-to-one -one mapping of, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to predict what the assembly is going to look like when you're dealing with C. Um, yeah, and another thing is C is easily readable, and it can, you know, be it's directly it's close to directly mapped back to what the assembly is going to look like. So, an important thing that I want to note for all you guys that are in intro to operating systems right now, um, we're going to be using Intel syntax and not AT&T syntax. Uh, I know that you guys cover in AT&T syntax in your intro to operating systems course. Um, the reality is that. Uh, Intel is the standard for uh, like tools and pretty much anything. It's I personally think it's a little bit easier to read. There's a little bit less fluff to it. Um, I just want to point this out. Um, yeah. So this lecture is going to focus on 32-bit x86 assembly. Um, that is, uh, most computers now run 64-bit, but 32-bit is a little bit easier to understand, and also it, you know, it's easier to source images from the internet that are a 32-bit uh, for, for the lecture. Um, the differences between them are pretty small, uh, at least uh, concerning uh, you know, the application uh, uh, for, for, for us developers. Um, yeah. So now we're going to move on to the basics, these uh, really abstract concepts. So the first thing that we're going to start off with is memory. Um, I want you to think of memory as one really big array, basically. Uh, this array has indices. In assembly, uh, we call them addresses. Uh, same with any program, it's sort of a big deal if you try to read something, read outside the array. Uh, same thing with memory, you can't read outside of the memory that you're currently allowed to, to read from. Um, so yeah, so take this as an example. Um, this is, a, you, we have four different, uh, let's see, can you see my, um, can you see my cursor? I have no idea if you can see my cursor. Um, well, we have four, 
you could see it. Okay, cool. We have four. Uh, we have four uh, places that we can put numbers, basically four four places where we can put any type of data, right? Um, our addresses are noted down here at the bottom. You'll notice that they're the same thing as the indices: zero, one, two, three. And we start off with all of our memory being zero. Um, yeah. So this is great and all. How do we actually move memory around? Um, the way that we do that is we use the MOV instruction. So let's try to MOV 1 into address 0. So we start off with 0, we MOV 1 into it, and there we go. Now we have 1 in there. Um, and assembly, in Intel assembly, this would be MOV uh, square brackets 0, 1. Um, the brackets mean a dereference. So if we go back to here, these brackets around the zero mean uh, the value at zero, basically. Um, that'll make a little bit more sense as we continue. Uh, yeah, the basics for the MOV instruction is going to be this. You're going to have your destination address in square brackets, and you're going to have your source in uh, on, on the right side separated by a comma. Um, yeah, so. Uh, that instruction that we just had, the index was zero, and uh, the number that we wanted to move into it, the new number was one. So, starting uh, from fresh, uh, we have three, five, ten, six. Uh, can anybody tell me what mov uh, two comma three will do? What value it will edit and whatnot? Uh, exactly what what whoever just said that was. First, we identify the address. That's going to be 2 right here. It's saying that the, the value at 2, our address 2 is 10. It's this cell right here. Uh, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to find what our source value is. That's going to be 3. And we're going to go ahead and put that in uh, in that in that uh, memory address. Excuse me. Um, yeah, cool. So now let's move on to registers. Um, I think that the biggest mistake that people can make when first learning about registers is thinking of them as variables. Um, the registers are not variables. They are not the same thing. In the assembly syntax, you might treat them, uh, they, they might look like they're being treated similar to, um, similar to variables in other languages, but they are not. So try not to think of them as, as variables. What they are are physical memory locations on your processor, on your CPU. Um, the reason uh, they hold very small amounts of data, that's another important thing. The reason why we use them is that uh, they perform super fast operations on whatever is in whatever is in them at any given time, a lot faster than memory. Um, yeah. So let's say we have a register and we'll call that register A. This register can hold eight bits or one byte of data. Um, so that means it can hold values between zero and 255. Um, so how do we move values in and out of registers, specifically from memory into a register or from a register into memory? Um, let's think about it like this. So same as the example before, we start off with our memory down here and we have this brand new idea, this idea of a register up here. Uh, register A. So how do we move data in and out of uh, that? Well, we would use the same thing as the MOV instruction. Uh, remember, it's MOV destination comma source, not source comma destination. Uh, this is the, the main difference in the Intel syntax is that it's destination source. So our destination is A and our source is 10. So what do we have to do? We have to identify where we're moving uh, our, our destination. That's going to be A. Uh, our new value is 10. What do we do? We move 10 into A. So now that's the new state after this instruction executes. Yeah. So now, a uh, more important question, how do we move things in between memory and registers? Well, we do that same thing with the mob instruction. We just throw in some, um, some of those square brackets uh, again. So the brackets being, uh, I don't mean the value zero, I mean the zero as an address. So whatever is at address zero. So this bracket is uh, what's at this address zero. The square bracket means the address zero. Uh, the source is going to be the value at address zero. The destination is going to be the register A. 
So we go ahead and we move what is in address zero, which is three, and we move it into register A, which is now going to be three. Cool. So now let's modify the value in our register in some way. Um, probably one of the easiest way to do that is with the add instruction. So uh, same thing with uh, the mov, it's going to be destination comma source. So our destination is going to be A, our source is going to be 10. The way that the add instruction works is it sort of works the same way that like the plus equal would work in most languages. You take the what's in the source, you take what's in the destination, you add them together, and then you store the result in the destination. So we add the two values together. Uh, 10 and what the value in A is, so that's 3, so 10 plus A, and we place the result in A, which is our destination. So we get 13. Um, that's great. So now, how do we move that value, that 13, back into memory? Well, we use a mov again. Uh, this time, we're setting the source to be the register A, and we're setting the destination to be the value at 0 at address zero. So we go ahead and we move 13 back into address zero. And now we have 13 in, in zero. Great. Um, so that was a lot of steps I know. I promise you it gets easier. You can sort of just start to read this stuff. Um, I want to pause now for any questions that people might have. Uh, it's sort of important that we understand these concepts before moving further. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. So the next thing I want to talk about is instructions. Um, there are a lot of them. Uh, yeah, sometimes you'll hear them called machine code or bytecode. That's the going to be the form of them that the uh, CPU actually interprets. So we can uh, read the assembly, uh, you know, mov a 10, and it gets translated to bytecode. So in this case, um, our human readable instruction is is this. When it gets translated to, when it gets compiled, it gets transformed into the bytecode or the machine code, which is which is this. Uh, this form is what the CPU actually sees and uh, interprets and uh, acts upon. Um, yeah. So some instructions um, that uh, that you may know you. Uh, We've already covered MOV. Uh, that's the most basic one. Um, the next is going to be ADD. Uh, we already covered that one. Um, this itself is not a uh, instruction, the ADD, uh, or the dereference, but it is an important thing for us to understand that these square brackets mean the value at this address, right? That the thing in inside of it is going to be an address. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the call function. Uh, this is like a fancy jump. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, we also have push. This pushes a value on top of the stack. We'll talk about what the stack is later. Uh, and then we have uh, my favorite things, which are the comparisons and the conditional jumps. Um, this is how we actually navigate around code. This is how we do uh, control flow, you know, things like if statements and stuff like that. How do we implement that in assembly? We do that through things like uh, the comp instruction and then a conditional jump. Um, so the comp uh, compares two values and it sets uh, flags in a special register. And then, uh, then if the next instruction is going to be a conditional jump, we can do conditional jumps based off of those two values. Um, the most simple ones are J E J N E. Um, that's jump equals jump if equal jump if not equal. So you can compare two things and then say uh, you know uh, jump if equal, which is the same thing as saying if something equals something, do this. Else, do this. That's how we implement that in assembly. Um, we'll I'll show you a graphical representation of what that looks like later. Um, yeah. So anytime you see an Excuse me. Anytime you see an instruction that you don't know, um, what you should do is look it up. There's a lot of them. Um, there's too many, really. Uh, x86 is very complicated. Um, there's a whole lot of instructions. I guarantee you that you will never learn them all, and you don't need to. Um, covering the instructions that we've talked about already is pretty much mostly what you need to just be able to read and write basic assembly. Um, yeah. 
And there are decades of form questions and posts on any and all assembly problems. Um, yeah, basically, as long as the internet has existed, there have been form questions on how assembly works, which is kind of cool. So you'll, you'll find the oldest form post you've ever seen well uh, if you're exploring like some weird assembly um, issues. Um, yeah, so now what I want to do is move on to the more uh, advanced topics. Uh, this is sort of where I want to give everybody a chance to ask questions, because if you don't understand the representation that I've given so far, it's going to be sort of difficult to move forward. Cool. So um, this is what the some of the registers, or most of the registers, on what a modern CPU look like. There are a lot of them. Um, Try not to get overwhelmed by this. We don't actually care about most of them. Um, for almost all of your assembly needs, you will not need to know any uh, most of these registers. Um, yeah, cool. So here are the ones that we really care about. Um, we have what are called, uh, uh, well, yeah. So something that's really confusing to new people is that we have different uh, registers all of them can be split down into different sections, and you can use different identifiers to refer to different sections of the same register, so sort of different sizes at different locations within the same register. That is definitely um, sort of a hard thing to understand, I think. Um, it, it's something that you sort of just have to accept and think about it um, uh, tr try to just understand it without this is why I said that you shouldn't think about these things as variables because this doesn't make any sense in the way that like variables work uh, in regular programs um, yeah so for example um, in the EAX register the AL section of the register refers to the lowest byte of the register um, the lowest eight bits of, of data in that register while EAX refers to the full four bytes. Now, this is the same register. It's just different sections and different sizes of data that you're referring to based off of that identifier. Um, when you're getting started off in this, uh, in assembly, it might be good to have something like a, a picture like this open so that you can see and maybe um, help you identify to say like, oh, I don't know CH. Uh, what which register is CH referring to? Oh, that's that's the... The, the high, uh, the sort of high, low byte, um, <laughs> it's hard to describe, of the ECX register. Um, yeah. So some registers we can use for anything, and some are quote unquote reserved for specific purposes. Um, one of those reserved registers is going to be ESP. That's going to be, we call this the stack pointer. Uh, more on the stack later. We'll talk about like where that actually, how that actually works, where that actually lives. Um, the second uh, one that we're going to be talking about is EBP, which is the base pointer. Um, this is used in tandem with the stack pointer um, to keep track of uh, the stack, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, yeah, more on that later. Um, yeah, so. Um, our program memory uh, is laid out in a really specific way. Um, some people will um, draw this differently. Some people will draw this upside down. I prefer to have my high addresses or high indices, if you want to think about it that way, at the top and the low addresses at the bottom. Um, it's sort of like a completely pointless debate in, you know, mostly older computer scientists that like argue between is does the stack grow up or down um, this this stack right here it, it's just about the orientation it doesn't actually matter as long as your um, the way that you think about it is um, you know makes sense for you basically I prefer high dresses at the top lower dresses at the bottom I think it just makes more sense to me um, yeah uh, and again it doesn't matter which one which model you adopt, they're exactly the same. They're just different representations. It's just different perspectives of the same thing. Um, yeah, so programs have this organization problem. We need to split things into sections of memory. Um, that means specific pieces of that array, specific ranges of indices, are going to be used for specific needs, right? Um, 
something that's important for uh, to understand with this is that this is all just data. It's all just uh, a, a big array with a lot of numbers in it. Um, we as programmers have to give purpose to the sections of data and we have to treat that data the way that it's supposed to in order for things to work. Um, this is sort of comes back to what I was talking about at the very beginning where I said that there are, are really no rules. Um, what I meant by that was, you know, this data, it's completely up to you to treat things the way that they're supposed to. It's completely up to you to um, treat things the way that they're supposed to be treated. Um, yeah, so talking about some of the things. Um, the stack is where local variables uh, for functions live and some other things. Um, we draw the stack, well, I draw the stack growing down. Some You might hear people also say that the stack grows up. Um, that's the same thing just from the other perspective where everything is uh, upside down from the way that I've drawn this. Yeah, uh, the heap is where dynamically allocated data lives. Um, if you know C or C++, the new and the malloc functions um, put data on the heap. Um, that's uh, wh what the heap is. The heap grows up. So the stack grows down and the heap grows up. When uh, it, some weird things can happen if these collide, usually the program will crash before that actually happens. But if you've ever heard of like a stack overflow or you know the form website stack overflow for like programming questions, um, that gets its name from, from the idea of the stack growing down. And if you call too many functions, the stack will actually grow so far down that it will uh, collide with other sections of memory. Um, and that's a problem. Um, yeah. So yeah, as you allocate more data in the heap, the, the heap grows up in this representation. Um, so the BSS and the data sections are for global variables. Uh, depending on how you initialize them in your code, they might go in the BSS or the dot data. That's not really important right now, so we'll just skip that. Uh, the text section holds the actual uh, data for the code. It holds the, holds the byte code for the assembly, the machine code uh, that gets executed. Um, I know it's weird that it's called the text section because it's code. Um, you just sort of have to accept it and move on. Um, yeah. So uh, we have a problem. How do we organize it? Um, there's basically no rules again, and how do we keep things straight? Well, we have to treat everything the way that it's supposed to be treated. Um, yeah. So the most basic thing that we can do to keep things straight uh, in an assembly program is we use something called a stack frame. Um, what the stack frame is is uh, a section on the stack where um, a specific function works off of. So every function call will have its own stack frame, as it's called. That stack frame will have all of its local variables, and then also a uh, a few things, a few other things like the arguments that were called for it, uh, and then the you know the the return address and the saved RBP. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, yeah. So the stack is made up of a bunch of frames, one for each function call. Um, yeah, so let's talk a little bit about instructions that help us manage stack frames. Um, there is an instruction I haven't told you about yet called call. What that does is it's sort of a fancy jump. It pushes the address of the next instruction to the stack. Uh, so it sort of saves it on in memory in the stack and then it jumps to whatever the new location uh, that you want to execute your code for. Uh, and then when you get to the end of your function, what you want to do is you want to call this new instruction called ret. And what that does is it pops the, uh, the instruction that you want to go back to, the, you know, the, the instruction that's after uh, what you, uh, where you were when the, the call happened. Uh, that puts it back into the uh, instruction pointer, which is a special register for holding the address of where you're currently executing. Yeah. Um, when a new function is called, it will run a prologue and an epilogue. Uh, what this is, the prologue sets up the stack frame and the epilogue cleans it up. Uh, I'm not going to get too into what that code actually looks like right now. Um, 
because it, it sort of takes a while to get into how to do it. It's basically just a set of mov, uh, a set of like instructions that will move values in registers around until um, you get the correct representation. So every function gets its own stack frame. It's responsible for cleaning it up after, uh, meaning uh, returning to basically the register, uh, the stack pointer and the base pointer state from before. Um, the stack frame is where local variables are stored. Uh, so do you remember EBP and ESP from before that I told you, I sort of hand waved it and said, you know, don't worry about this right now. We'll talk about this later. Um, what EBP is, it's a register that points to the top of your locals in your stack frame. Uh, it's called the base pointer. The ESP is the bottom of your stack. That's, it's a register that holds the address or you know, the indice of the bottom of your stack. Um, we use these two registers to sort of um, keep track of where the current stack frame is. So um, everything in the stack frame is an offset of either RBP or RSP. Um, yeah, every all of your local variables are in between these two values, are in between these two addresses. Um, the different functions, different functions will need different amounts of space depending on how many variables they're using, what the size of those variables is, the amount of data that they need. Um, so it's not consistent as to which ones are uh, are going to be, uh, uh, what, how much space is going to be used at any one given time. Um, yeah, it's up to each function to um, set the amount of space that they need for, for that. And that's just a matter of moving the RSP up and down, essentially, uh, based on their needs. Um, so to understand the return address, let's go back to what the program memory layout looks like. Um, going back, we have a text section where I said that the actual code for the uh, program lives, the bytecode. What that actually is, is just a section of that array where the data for the compiled assembly lives. Um, what the return address is, uh, well, that means that all of the code also has addresses. It also has indices that you can refer to, to it um, by. What the ad return address is, is the saved address for where we should go back to when the function ends. Uh, it's going to be the next address after the call, basically. Um, I'm not going to get too into what that actually looks like in a program. I'm going to leave that for the next lecture. Um, for now, I just want to address what some of the differences in 32-bit versus 64-bit um, x86 looks like. For 32-bit, um, the calling conventions are different uh, than in 64-bit. That's sort of, for programmers, that's the main difference. Um, 32-bit, we pass values on the stack. In 64-bit, when we call a new function, we put the values in registers. Um, you don't have to memorize any of this. Um, I would recommend that you just look it up anytime that you need to, anytime that you need to know. Um, yeah, so tools. Let's talk about tools a little bit. Um, this is probably the section that's going to be the most relevant for actually you OS students. Um, because we just don't cover tools in OS, and I think that that's sort of unfortunate. Um, the most basic of which is Obstump, which is I think the only one of the only tools that is actually covered in operating systems. Um, you basically use this when you have no other option. Um, this is what the output for uh, an Obstump would look like. You basically can just run it on a compiled program and it will tell you exactly what the assembly is. It will tell you what the bytecode is. So let's sort of deconstruct this a little bit. Um, in the first option, I'm saying dash capital M Intel. That's me asking for Intel syntax. Uh, I say dash dash disassemble equals and then underscore start. Underscore start is a function in that compiled program. So I'm asking to disassemble just that function, not the whole thing, just that function. And then the last thing is the executable, the compiled program. Um, yeah. So then pulling apart what the actual output looks like. Um, this is the compiled bytecode right here uh, on, the, on the left. And on the right, we have the human readable assembly. Um, yeah. This compiled bytecode, you might notice that there are, are different sizes of addresses. I think um, 
somebody from the OS class. You guys went through uh, computer architecture using MIPS, right? Okay, yeah. So the once the one semester that I took uh, computer architecture was the one semester that they uh, tested out switching the curriculum to x86. Um, so this is probably going to be one of the weird things. Instructions have different sizes with the compiled uh, bytecode representation, which is sort of can be a little bit weird. Um, in MIPS, I know that the instructions are, I believe, four bytes in length always. Uh, in x86, they are different sizes. Um, yeah, just an important thing to note uh, when you're when you're reading it because it will look different. Um, yeah. So now one of my favorite tools, uh, actually, is Kyle here? Kyle is not here. Okay. A former lab member uh, works at the company that makes Binary Ninja. I was sort of hoping that he would be here. Um, I can't recommend this enough for new people. Cloud.binary.ninja is the website that you'll want to get Binary Ninja from. Um, they have a all web form for this now. Uh, you don't have to download a pro uh, download their program. You don't have to pay for a license. Uh, you can just use their their website and it's it covers basically everything that you would need for to start off an assembly. I can't recommend cloud.binary.ninja enough for new people. It's the easiest way to get set up. Um, yeah. So this is what binary ninja cloud is going to look like. Uh, you have your functions and your different uh, what are called symbols. It's basically just a name given to an address in your program. Um, so like functions are symbols and then you might have symbols for variables and stuff like that. You have your symbols on the left right here and then you have your actual uh, program uh, in, in the center uh, here. So something that I want to point out to you guys in OS because I know that you guys have not seen this before unless you've you came to like last week's uh, recitation or whatever, but uh, there are graphs. This is the like the the best way to to view assembly is to read things as graphs. So the way that we interpret this is we basically call each, each of, of these things, things basic, basic blocks. blocks. What, what that, that means is uh, it's, it's code, code in, in between be when there's a jump instruction. So be that a conditional jump or just a regular jump instruction. Um, instead of thinking of things linearly, which I'm sure that a lot of you think about assembly as just one straight line of code where you can sort of just jump up and down, the way, the modern way of thinking about this is through these graphs, where anytime you have a conditional jump or a jump, you sort of think about it as branching, right? Um, it makes it really easy to understand this control flow. Um, so down at the bottom here, we have a comp instruction and then a JE instruction. Um, and then a green line and a red line. So what does that mean? That means that um, this is a conditional jump, and that means that uh, we can think about this as sort of an if statement, right? We're comparing two values here. We're saying, you know, compare these two things, and then if those two things were equal, go down here. So if true, jump, jump down to this block, and if false, jump down to this block. I think that this representation is the best way to try to view and read assembly. It's really hard to think about things linearly. It's really hard to just look at a, a block of code and not be able to, and be able to track around all these jumps and stuff like that. It's just um, not really realistic to do that in this day and age when we have tools like this, like cloud.binary.ninja. Um, it's definitely most people's preferred way to read assembly. Um, yeah. So uh, the last thing that I have for you guys today is something that I think is probably covered in Introduction to Operating Systems. Um, is Has uh, Professor Gustavo talked about Godbolt yet? OK, yeah. So what this is is a website. I definitely would recommend, let me blow this up a little bit. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit, and let me switch to C. Uh, cool. What this is, is this is a, uh, oh, hold on. I might need to, yeah, I need to switch my screen in Discord. Hold on one second. Uh, okay, cool. You guys can see this website. 
So what this website lets you do is it lets you pick different languages on the left. Uh, I'm going to use C, you can also do C++, whatever. Uh, and it will show you what it gets compiled to in assembly. Um, let me actually, I'm going to change one thing. I'm going to change this to light mode because that's going to be a little bit easier to, for people to read in the stream. Um, yeah, so we can sort of, I definitely recommend that anybody that tries to learn assembly play around with this because as you can see, as I'm moving my cursor around, it's actually saying what parts of the assembly are responsible for what parts of the C. I think that this is, this could not be more helpful. Um, I think that, uh, actually, let's change this to, let's change this. See, it gives you like all these different compilers, all these different options. This is like a really a beautiful tool. Uh, you can try with different compiler options too. Um, most modern compilers let you optimize things. So what that means is you can like set flags that basically mean like 03 means like highly optimized. Um, you know, it, it reduced all that just down to this. It tries to figure out exactly what the minimal amount of instructions that it can run to to run this program. See, it doesn't even it doesn't even set up the the stack frame at all or anything. It just it just straight up just does the thing and uh, returns. Uh, let's go back to the regular view. So yeah, this is definitely a very fun thing to do. We can say int uh, um, uh, mystery here and we can just say int i1 equals 1 i2 equals 1 uh, for i1 less than less than i2 or I don't know. You could just sort of play around with this and um, uh, I one plus plus here. So yeah, I just wrote this completely nonsensical function. What does it do? What does it look like in assembly? Well, it looks like this. You can sort of start to see that it's setting uh, that this, here, let me get rid of this function up here so it's a little bit more clear. Um, this is another thing. Actually, um, for those of you that are in OS, this is actually a good trick that I don't think Gustavo teaches. Um, uh, I'm sure that he's covered these um, these things symbols. They're names that you give to certain addresses. Uh, it's the way that we identify functions. I think something that is not covered in um, in OS is you can actually have local symbols. So what that means is if your symbol starts with a period, that means that it's a symbol that's local to the current function. So what that means is that this L3 can be uh, is can only be referred to within the cons within the scope of mystery because it has a period before it. Um, I think that that's a nice little trick. So if you're writing anything that's that's with loops where you need to like sort of jump in between addresses and stuff like that. Um, you can do that with periods and that's sort of the proper way to do things. Um, yeah. Uh, another thing to note, this word pointer right here, um, that is something that sometimes pops up in uh, Intel uh, assembly. What that means is just a size specification. It's saying that um, the double word, which means the, the four bytes at this address, basically at barbie p minus four. Um, yeah, so that's going to be four bytes off of, remember the rbp is the top of your stack frame. So this is going to be four bytes, four, um, four values down from the top of your current stack frame is, is what that means. Um, yeah, cool. Definitely try to play around with this, play around with your languages and stuff like that. Um, this is sort of a lot of fun, I think. Uh, and it's really good that you can see sort of what parts of the code tr translates to which parts of assembly. Um, yeah, cool. Um, let me switch back to... Cool. So yeah, that's the end of practical assembly and uh, from the ground up. Uh, I can... Uh, does anybody have any questions about anything that we covered here?
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually, that's a really good question. The answer to that is you basically, uh, there would be an arrow that comes, uh, can you see my cursor, Andy? Okay, the, the, the line would come out and it would go up and back like that. read the memory address and jump where it goes. I am not sure how Binary Ninja would interpret that. Um, Binja, or... Oh, hey, it's Kyle. It, it would interpret that. Okay, yeah, um... What if that was from a user specified variable though? Like how would it? Yeah, okay, uh, I guess question mark there, uh, <laughs> Andy. Um, Yeah, I think, so Binary Ninja does a lot of analysis in the background of, uh, well, any, most of these like more complicated tools do uh, analysis in the background. They try to figure out what values will be at any given point and give you better graphs and a better representation based off of its understanding of the assembly. Um, I think that if it couldn't, I'm not sure how it would handle if it couldn't figure out what the value was going to be. Um, actually, that might be a jump table, right? Uh, Kyle, it's, it's sort of like that situation. Yeah. Yeah, so there's this thing called a jump table. Andy, do you know what that is? It's sort of uh, like if you know switch statements in C, that's sort of how they sometimes end up looking in assembly. It's basically a uh, a set of um, it's something where you're doing a jump based off of a some, some kind of a, a, a variable basically um, what I mean by that is you will jump to different locations based off of some other condition um, this is a notoriously hard thing for uh, these these you know tools to pick up uh, sometimes you have to tell it Tell, tell your tool that, that you're actually looking at a jump table uh, for it to give you a good representation of what's actually going on. So that's another thing. Um, as amazing as things like Binary Ninja or you know some of the alternatives would be Ghidra or Ida Pro, as amazing as they are, uh, sometimes they guess and sometimes they guess wrong. So sometimes you need to hold your tool's hand to give you a better representation of uh, what the assembly is actually doing, a better representation of the graph. Um, so that's sort of more advanced for most basic needs, like basic reverse engineering challenges or pwning challenges, or you know, for all you guys that are in operating systems, um, for your needs, you won't need to know uh, like how to do that. Th those more complicated things, like you'll never see a jump table uh, in an operating systems homework. Um, I don't. I'm not even sure that it's covered. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll take questions on anything else, anything else that we covered. Uh, okay, cool. Well, this was a little bit under an hour. Uh, I'm very happy with the time. I was worried that this was going to go over. Um, Cool. Yeah, I guess that's the end. I want to thank everybody for coming here. If you want the slides, I have dropped a PDF in Pound Public. Um, 
go ahead and download that if you want. Uh, so yeah, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, next week we're going to continue off of this. I think uh, we're probably going to dive a little bit more into tools, maybe go over, uh, do something a little bit more interactive. Uh, watch out pound announcements here on Discord or on our Slack for what we're doing next week. Uh, it will definitely be a continuation of this. So I hope you guys learned something. I hope you guys picked up something new. Um, thank you for coming. And yeah, see ya.